Uh, today's, mod today's moderators will be Dr. Valerie Mwenda from the Ministry of Health together with the Dr. Veronica Manduku. And we have lined up uh, a series of talks on, on breast cancer. Let me just welcome uh, Valerian Mwenda uh, to take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you confirm if you can hear me? I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, sorry, I think I'm sorry, just voice there. So, thank you very much, uh, uh, and welcome to this um, symposium. Um, um, uh, I'll be moderating together with Dr. Maduku, who has already introduced. I want this opportunity to introduce our panelists for this afternoon, um, starting with Dr. J.P. Bo Malenya, who is a program officer at the National Cancer Control Program. Dr. Bohr is the lead uh, of the uh, first um, pillar of the National Cancer Control Strategy that focuses on cancer prevention, early detection, and, and, and screening. Our second panelist will be Dr. Mario Badawi, who is a consultant general surgeon and also the lead breast service at the Coast General Teaching and Referral Hospital. Our third panelist will be Dr. Alindra Moss, who is a radiologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital. Our next panelist will be uh, Christine Mogositati. Christine is the executive director of the Kenyan Network of Cancer Organizations. And with her today, she's, um, uh, we have Sarah Wango, who is a breast cancer survivor and a member of the uh, Symbol of Hope Warriors, a CBO that is registered under the Kenyan Network of Cancer Organizations. And our, our final um, our panelist will be Maria Adera. Uh, Maria is a uh, um, um, senior benefits quality assurance and contracting officer at the National uh, so uh, thank you very much for welcome. I want to invite all the members to actually participate in this symposium. Um, use the chat to ask your questions as we continue the program, but also uh, during the question and answer uh, session, you'll be invited also to be able to ask your questions also on voice. Uh, every panelist, every speaker will be granted 15 minutes to take us through um, their uh, allocated topic. And uh, without further ado, I want to welcome the first speaker is going to take us through breast cancer policy and burden in Kenya. Thank you, Dr. Bor, and welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valeria. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're doing well where you are. And uh, I am delighted to on this uh, I'm discussing uh, issues around breast cancer because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Kenya. So I'm going to share my screen and take us through uh, the breast cancer uh, burden in Kenya and the policy. What are we doing uh, about the burden? So as I've been saying, uh, uh, affiliation is to the National Cancer Control Program. And uh, I'll talk us through briefly uh, an introduction uh, about then and the policy. Uh, important aspect, which is monitoring and evaluation, lastly, barriers and challenges before I call you to action. So, as you may know, breast cancer is uh, the most common type of cancer overall in Kenya. And, uh, and uh, it is the third leading cause of cancer deaths overall. Every day we are losing seven women to breast cancer. In our setting here, breast cancer occurs uh, earlier, uh, at an earlier age compared to uh, uh, the Western world. And so um, it's good for us to, to know that and that, that affects our policies. So, um, out of 10 women in Kenya, seven are diagnosed late. Uh, this is, you know, according to the stage in stage three or four. Breast cancer is rare in men, less than 1% uh, of cases in, in the men and majority of breast cancer cases and that's a kind of middle income countries. Early detection is critical. It's really critical. And that's why uh, I think the next speaker will be talking a lot more about that. So just looking at the burden of cancer globally, I want to bring your attention here. Uh, I hope you're able to follow my cursor. Maybe I can get a pointer. Uh, but basically, 
you can see that uh, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer, the leading cancer globally of 2 million cases globally. Uh, I want you to observe uh, and see that in terms of uh, the deaths, the deaths due to breast cancer is number five, about 600,000 deaths. Uh, so you can see that globally, the global picture is that uh, if you get breast cancer, you are likely to survive it. Uh, look at the picture in Kenya, uh, noting that cancer is the second leading cause of non-communicable disease related deaths and that there's a rising trend of uh, cancer deaths in Kenya. Uh, look at uh, breast cancer here uh, in terms of new cases. We have about 6,800 6, deaths, eh? new cases of breast cancer every year. And uh, when you look at the picture again, uh, the two, the two cancers are women cancers, breast uh, and cervical cancer. When you come to death, uh, you see that cervical cancer becomes first and breast cancer becomes second. So this means that at the, um, probably the survival for breast cancer is better compared to cervical cancer. Uh, so looking at the eight standardized uh, rates, uh, mortality, uh, incidence and mortality rates, you can see breast cancer is here, being in 2020, and the deaths are just uh, flowing there. Eh? Yeah, so that is the picture of breast cancer in Kenya. Uh, I want us now to move on to look at the policy, what is being done about this. And you can see that there's a, there's a global uh, breast cancer initiative, uh, 2021, I'm missing a one there. Uh, this was launched by WHO um, in response to the rising burden of breast cancer and the realization that there's a lot that can be done to prevent breast cancer. So uh, the goal of this policy is to avert uh, close to 2.5 million deaths by two by 2040. You know, when people used to say 2030, it seems so far, but it's seeming nearer and nearer, and the same will be the case for uh, 2040. So the, this uh, policy is anchored on three pillars. Uh, I'll be telling you more about those pillars. And, uh, you know, every time there's this global initiative, the idea is to spark collective action and provide momentum so that we can address the problem. Looking more closely at the, at the pillars of this global breast cancer initiative, the first pillar is on health promotion and early detection. This uh, here now, the real the target is to diagnose, uh, achieve diagnosis of breast cancer, at least 60% of the, the cases to be diagnosed in stage one or two. The second pillar is talking about family diagnosis, and this pillar now also has a 60, which is a 60-day diagnosis that evaluation, imaging, tissue sampling, and pathology should be completed within 20, within 60 days of contact with the health system. So this requires our health workers, some of you are here, to be aware, to be well educated on the signs and symptoms of breast cancer so that you can refer the women to diagnostic services. Uh, in a timely manner. And then the last pillar is on comprehensive breast cancer treatment. And here we are saying that 80% of women or you know, clients diagnosed with breast cancer should undergo full courses of the treatment of different modes successfully and return home. So you're looking at a 60, 60, 80 cascade. I hope you'll remember that. In Kenya, what have we done? We have a robust policy environment here in Kenya. You know, without a policy framework, it's difficult to raise funds. It's difficult to mobilize uh, even human resource and other kinds of resources. You probably may have seen this. We have the Kenya, Kenya Cancer Policy. We have uh, a National Cancer Control Strategy, which is aspiring and we are revising. We have the treatment protocols. We have the screening guidelines. We have now, this is the main document of the moment the Breast Cancer Screening and Early Diagnosis Action Plan. And I hope you can familiarize yourself with it and you can download it on the MOH website. We also have a palliative care policy. We also have uh, specimen handling guidelines because you know cancer diagnosis is based on uh, specimen histology. So what do our screening guidelines say about uh, breast cancer? 
screening, uh, that mammography is the re main recommended method for screening. There are other complementary methods which are recommended to aid in early diagnosis, which has been identified as very important in breast cancer. This is the breast self exam, clinical breast exam, and also ultrasound as a modality. Uh, and for selected high risk groups, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging is very important. Uh, now, more specifically to what the guidelines say about the age to start screening and the frequency of screening, it depends on the risk assessment. There will be average risk women and high risk women. I think uh, this will be discussed further, but for average risk women, they're supposed to be screened uh, every year between ages 40 and 55 using a mammogram uh, or ultrasound, but mostly mammogram and then 56, to 74 years, you know, the frequency reduces to every two years. And this is the summary of the guideline recommendation, uh, which I will not uh, go through so much. But just to highlight that you can see CB, clinical breast exam, start from age 25. Yeah, and uh, it should be done every three years, but if uh, somebody is 35 to 39, it's being done between once uh, every year or every three years. But by the time one is 40, you need to be getting clinical breast exams every year. And when you reach 56, you can do them every other year along with mammography. So uh, we also have the Breast Cancer Screening and Early Diagnosis Action Plan, which has five key result areas that it focuses on. The first one is on governance and policy. Uh, here we are addressing issues of the policy environment. The second one is on creating demand and engaging communities and educating them so that they can take up the services. So here we are talking about educating community health volunteers, uh, using the media to educate uh, the general public, using survivors as champions to educate uh, people. And that's why we have even on this uh, panel a survivor who will be sharing her experience. Then we have a health provider uh, training and professional development, very important. You saw the second pillar of the global uh, initiative uh, that we need best, we need health workers to, to be able to have a higher index of suspicion and be able to uh, fast track the diagnosis of clients. The fourth pillar is on service delivery. And uh, here now we are addressing screening, diagnostics, patient navigation and referral. And in service delivery, we have this concept of the rapid diagnostic clinics, which we are looking at having one in every county. And uh, we will launch the first one uh, at KU on Friday. So at KU uh, Teaching and Referral Hospital, there will be the first rapid diagnostic clinic uh, where now we will be able to achieve this 60-day uh, target. Then lastly, monitoring and evaluation. And I'll say a bit more about that if time allows. I just wanted to show you the social ecological model that we are using. We are not looking at a one, you know, we are not really looking at this uh, uh, addressing breast cancer in Kenya from one dimension, but we are looking at it from different dimensions, starting with individual level, uh, where we address barriers and raise uh, awareness and interpersonal. This includes training of providers and then organizational. We are looking at the system. We're looking at the universal, universal health coverage, UHC. We're looking at having NHIF, and they are here with us today. And also looking at professional bodies supporting, you know, the whole environment. Then we have the community. We have uh, the various organizations. We have civil society, community-based organizations, and also research. And we have civil society here with us today. And uh, we'll crown it all. Uh, we have the policy making sure we have an enabling environment, we are controlling and making sure that there's quality and so forth. So uh, I said, I'll speak a little more about monitoring and evaluation. This is very important uh, because data is key for us to make informed decisions, to measure our impact. Are we just working or are we making impact? Also to plan strategically, what are we going to do next, our interventions? to manage logistics and also for operational research. And some of the indicators we look at in M&D for the breast cancer program include screening coverage. Uh, we look at positivity rate and uh, the biopsy rate. The screening coverage is basically the proportion of, of, of women, the percentage of women screened as a proportion of the eligible 
women who are supposed to be screened within that period. Positivity rate, the number who are screened, and then they have positive screening results per 1,000 women screened and biopsy rate. You know that the next, we'll be hearing more about these uh, biopsies, but we need, we need to know how many ultrasound guided biopsies are performed for those who are eligible. We use these tools to track, uh, to record data and, they, and track our, our, our you know, progress. We have uh, MOH412 screening register, and we have MOH screening summary, which uh, cancer screening summary, which you know the data from this register is collated into the screening summary and onto the KHIS. And uh, we also have treatment registers and uh, treatment summaries for every month. Uh, there are various barriers, you know, why are we not doing so well with breast cancer? Some are structural, some are sociocultural, some are personal, some are financial. Uh, structural bar barriers, uh, things to do with the health system where we have lack of, uh, you know, access to services. Weak referral networks, lacking patient in, uh, navigators, and sometimes the geographic distribution of services, you may find that one facility, uh, the, the county referral, which has maybe mammogram is so far from where the client is. We have social cultural barriers, which uh, prevent access and the uptake of the services, things like stigma, myths and misconceptions and poor linkages between health facilities and communities. Personal barriers include poor health literacy and awareness. We need to be aware of risk factors. We need to be aware of the importance of early detection. And then also there are some psycho psychosocial barriers to treatment that come into play. And uh, lastly, the financial barrier. Here we have lack of health insurance uh, and high out-of-pocket expenditure, what is called you know, catastrophic expenditure. And uh, we are happy NHIF is with us. They will tell us they are rule. And more specifically at Kenya, we have some challenges. Women are not taking up screening as much as we would like them to. Uh, the figures are, are as low as 25%, according to some surveys that have been done. And even few, fewer, fewer uh, you know, for performing a self-breast exam, you find that only about a quarter of women do that on a regular basis. For now being seen by a doctor or a health provider, only 14% have done that. And then we have low awareness on screening services. People don't know where to access the services. We have a late diagnosis. I think I already mentioned that. Inadequacy of equipment and treatment services. We are continuing to do a lot as a ministry uh, in terms of providing treatment services. We now have uh, about uh, 10, 11, uh, the cancer treatment centers in the country, including uh, latest three comprehensive uh, cancer treatment centers that have radiology in addition to what was there before. Uh, looking also another challenge is registration and surveillance and also low utilization rates for the equipment that is available. For example, mammogram, all 47 counties have mammograms, but uh, only less than 1% of all eligible women were screened in 2018, according to a survey that was done. So allow me to call you to action. There's much for you to do. Uh, let's join hands together towards the 60, 60, 80 target of health promotion, timely diagnosis, and comprehensive treatment and care. So thank you very much, and I'll be taking questions at the appropriate time as we'll be guided by the moderator. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Mwenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Bor, for taking us through uh, the first topic, and then you're well uh, fit in the Global Breast Cancer Initiative within our local policy context. Um, our next speaker will be Badawi, who will take us through a primary prevention and early prevention approach for breast cancer. Thank you and Karibu. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mwenda. Uh, my name is Dr. Mariam Badawi. Please confirm that you can hear me properly. Yes, we can, we can Dr. Ari. 
All right, thank you very much. So um, thank you, Dr. Bohr, for that uh, good uh, introduction. Today, I'm going to discuss breast cancer screening and early detection, which will form the basis upon which we'll reach that 60, 60, 80 target, hopefully. All right, so uh, the outline for my presentation will be screening for breast cancer and then uh, early detection, basically the triple assessment. So what is screening? Screening is uh, investigations performed in the absence of clinical symptoms or signs of breast cancer. So these are women who have no breast masses, no breast pain, no nipple discharge. They have no symptoms whatsoever and they go for regular screening in order for them, for us to detect the cancer at the earliest stage possible. Because uh, when we detect it at the earliest stages, that is like stage zero or stage one, we manage to improve prognosis and thus uh, reduce mortality from breast cancer. So what is screening versus early diagnosis? So the two are not exactly the same. So screening, when we look at this uh, diagram, screening uh, basically targets the pre-invasive stage of breast cancer. That is when the cancer has not, uh, it's only a group of abnormal cells that have not uh, invaded the basement membrane. So they're called ductal carcinoma in situ. And it is that stage that would be the best stage at which for us to detect the cancer. And that's when we do screening because in such patients, they normally don't have uh, any symptoms. Some of them would have symptoms, but uh, when they don't have symptoms, that uh, forms the group that we target when we do uh, screening. However, when the symptoms start at this stage, that's when our investigations now aim to, uh, for us to have early diagnosis. So when the symptoms start is when we aim for early diagnosis, which is what uh, will be the second part of my discussion. So what is the rationale for us to do breast cancer screening? Why don't we uh, emphasize on the same for all types of cancers? So the reason is that uh, increasing incidence of breast cancer in the country and rather globally, and uh, from Global Cancer 2020, we know that uh, breast cancer forms 16.1% of all cancers in both genders. And uh, in women, it actually forms 25.6% of the cancers. It is the number one cancer in women in our country. And um, unfortunately, we have a younger age at presentation, like discussed in the previous presentation. So our age group, uh, our peak incidence comes at the ages of 35 to 50, as opposed to ages of 50 to 65 in the Western population. And uh, a study done locally found that 60% of our patients actually present at stage three and four. So this is the number that we need to reverse. We need 60% to present at stage one and two rather than stage three and four. So who should be screened? Is it any woman? No. So um, the method and frequency of screening is determined by characteristics of individual women. And what we do is that we do something called risk assessment. That risk assessment is performed uh, when you encounter any woman at the clinic for whatever other purpose. So we do the, screen, um, the risk assessment using the Tyracusic model, which is the one agreed upon in our national guidelines. And uh, this risk assessment model divides our patients into average and high risk groups. So who are these groups? The average risk group are women who basically do not exhibit any risk factors that are defined by the high, the high risk population. The high risk population are those women who have a first degree relative who's been affected by breast cancer, or if herself she's had an abnormal breast biopsy previously. An abnormal breast biopsy that would concern us would be that for high-risk lesions like atypical ductal hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ. 
And uh, also if the patient has a history of previous chest wall irradiation as part of treatment for things like Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if they've had that in their past medical history, that puts them at a higher risk for getting breast cancer. And also if the lady herself had a breast cancer on one side and now we, uh, she's at a higher risk of getting breast cancer on the other side, or if she had breast conservation then in the remaining uh, breast. So the average risk are any women, women who do not fit the high risk criteria. And the exclusion to this is if the patient already has signs and symptoms suggestive of breast cancer, she's no longer at average risk Actually, she's no longer at a screening uh, group. She's now patient for early diagnosis. And um, also if she's had a previous diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ, and men also do not fall in this category. So the average risk population, how do we screen them? Now, uh, of note is that more than 80% of women actually fall, fall under the average risk population. And uh, the way we screen them, we start at the age of 25, but uh, we start with clinical breast examination every three years for those age 25 to 34. And uh, the frequency can be done every one to three years, depending on uh, clinical uh, the circumstances. And uh, of note is that a mammogram is not recommended at this stage. Then uh, from the age of, this, of 35 to 39, we do clinical breast examination plus an ultrasound or a mammogram. This is also determined by the findings uh, during that clinical breast examination. These ones will guide us on whether we need to do an ultrasound or a mammogram. As discussed before, the main modality for breast cancer screening is actually mammography. It is mammography that's been shown to uh, contribute to reduction in breast cancer mortality. So uh, breast cancer screening is not complete without a mammography, and, but the mammography is only added when the woman reaches the age of 40. So from 40 to 55, we do clinical breast examination plus mammography, and this is done annually. Now, we may find uh, some organizations or uh, centers uh, promoting uh, breast cancer screening, but it is only clinical breast examination. It is important that when women present to these screening programs, they have to be told that that screening is not complete until she does a mammography if she is above the age of 40. And then from the ages of 56 to 74, we do the same, but we increase the interval to every two years. This of course provided this patient has been regular with her annual mammography when she was in this age group. But if she is starting off her screening at this stage, you may decide to do it annually depending on her risk factors. And then when a patient uh, is, reaches the age of 75 and above, then we consider the individual health factors and women's preference to continue screening. Again, this is, it only applies to women who have been following this entire schedule, but we find some women who present to us at the age of 70 maybe, and that's when they want to start screening. So you might consider doing it for a few years and then uh, if it is okay, then we might consider stopping. But all these have to be done under consideration of the individual health factors. So uh, what about the high risk groups? So re we remember the four criteria for the high risk groups. One of them is having one or two affected first degree relatives. If someone has one or two affected first degree relatives with breast cancer, so for them, we have to start the clinical breast examination at the age of 25, and we start them on annual mammograms, but the mammograms for this particular group has to start 10 years younger than the youngest case in the family. So assuming um, the youngest case in the family is the age of 40, they have, um, the patient has, her, her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 40. 
So for her, for that particular lady, we have to start her annual mammograms at the age of 30. However, this 10 years uh, younger should not be started below the age of 25. So for instance, if the patient had her sister with breast cancer at the age of 35, or rather, let me say 30, the breast cancer was diagnosed at the age of 30, then we cannot say that for the other lady, we have to start at the age of 20. No, for her, then we'll start the annual mammograms at the age of 25. Also, uh, we cannot go beyond the age of 40, meaning if the patient had all her relatives diagnosed at the age of 55, we cannot say that we'll start her screening at the age of 45, rather we'll have to start at the age of 40. So annual mammograms are started 10 years younger than the youngest case in the family, provided it's not before 25 or after the age of 40. And then complementary imaging can be requested when appropriate for these patients. Complementary imaging include either ultrasound or MRI based on the circumstances for each patient. Now, for patients who have had a history of atypical ductal hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ, then for them, we do clinical breast examination every six to 12 months, as well as annual mammograms. Those with a history of chest wall radiation, we also do clinical breast examination annually and the annual mammograms and MRI starting five years after the radiation but again, not earlier than the age of 25 and not later than the age of 40, just like in the previous group. And uh, history of uh, previous breast cancer in the same patient. So we have to do clinical breast examination every six to 12 months and annual mammograms as well. So this concludes the high risk group population. And then there's a group of patients who we might have to send for genetic testing and these patients include any individual who now has three or more cases of breast and or ovarian cancer in two or more generations. And at least one case with the onset under the age of 50. So a lady with this characteristic has to be sent for genetics testing because they might have um, an inherited type of uh, breast cancer. Also patients with bilateral primary uh, breast cancer. So uh, that is a patient who's presented with breast cancer at the same time on both sides. Or breast cancer uh, for a patient age 35 or younger. And also those who have triple negative breast cancer at the age of 60 or younger. Primary breast and ovarian cancer in the same patient. Male breast cancer at age 65 or younger, or at any age, if they have a close family history of breast cancer, and confirmed BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the family. So anyone with these characteristics should be sent for genetic testing. So what is the screening modality used? I've already uh, discussed, and it was also mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. So the recommended screening is using a mammogram. And it is the only screening method shown to reduce mortality from breast cancer. Other modalities uh, include uh, clinical breast examination. It is used as part of uh, physical examination, used to educate women. Uh, it's an opportunity to educate women on their breast health. And it cannot be used as a substitute for mammography. And uh, breast ultrasound is uh, used as an adjunct to clinical breast examination in women between the ages of 35 to 39. And it can also complement a mammogram in some patients who have dense breasts. Then we have uh, breast MRI. It is not recommended for women with average risk, but it is used as a screening tool in high risk uh, women alongside a mammogram. Now we move on to early detection of breast cancer. These are the patients who have symptomatic uh, breast cancer. So it is basically timely evaluation that is needed for us to detect it early enough. So how do we evaluate a symptomatic patient? We use the triple assessment, clinical breast examination, followed by imaging, followed by biopsy. Now, clinical breast examination, um, this is how you examine a patient 
who might be having uh, breast cancer, we, uh, we have to ask the lady to sit up on the bed first. We have to examine them while seated. We expose them from the navel upwards. First of all, we do what we call inspection. We look for any skin changes, any obvious breast masses, any nipple changes like nipple uh, discharge or nipple inversion. We look for any skin ulceration or uh, orange peel appearance that is also called uh, pudorange. And then we start palpating, we examine the breast by manually and we also examine for axillary lymph nodes as well as supraclavicular nodes over here. And then we ask the patient to lie down and we do our examination again of the breast. It has to span the whole entire anatomical area of the breast from the midline to the clavicle to the anterior axillary line and to the inframammary fold. This entire area can be examined by, by any of these three methods provided that um, we cover the entire area and uh, we use usually the pads of the three fingers uh, of the hands to do the examination. We don't use the tips. Once we encounter a breast mass, we have to describe it, the size, consistency, whether it's attached to the underlying muscles or overlying skin, and uh, also if it is tender or not. Once we've completed our examination, we go to our uh, documentation. This is how we document our findings. We write the location of the breast mass uh, on an o'clock position, mentioning the size and also how far it is from the nipple areola complex. So for example, this mass would be a three centimeter mass. Let's say it's a three by three centimeter mass located at one to two o'clock position, two centimeters from the nipple areola complex. And also in the documentation, we have to mention any skin or nipple changes noted, any nipple discharge that is obvious and the nodal status. This finally takes us to our clinical TNM staging. After this, we send our patients for imaging and the imaging we request for is diagnostic mammogram for patients above the age of 40 or a breast ultrasound for those below the age of 40. And an ultrasound may be added to women above the age of 40 if we need better characterization of the lesion or for lymph nodes assessment. After this, we go on to the third part of the triple assessment that is biopsy. Now core biopsy is the recommended modality for solid lesions or complex cysts. A complex cyst is a cyst that has both solid and cystic components. So we do core biopsy of the solid component of that complex cyst. And uh, most of the time we need to do it with image guidance. Um, now, FNAs are uh, best used to aspirate a cyst under ultrasound guidance and for sampling suspicious axillary lymph nodes, but it's not recommended for solid lesions. In some centers in the West, it is used for solid lesions, but it is used as a triage procedure to uh, quickly look at the mass if it is ben uh, benign or malignant, but this is in the setup whereby the patient has just had the imaging with a mammogram or ultrasound. It's reported there and then the FNA is taken in the same sitting and then that FNA is interpreted again in the same sitting. So in that same day, in that same um, v hospital visit, the patient gets her imaging and the FNA and the FNA results. Then it is determined whether it's benign or malignant. And if it's seen to be malignant, then the patient goes ahead and does the core biopsy. But in our setups, that is, um, it's not feasible. Most of our patients, if they are sent for FNA, by the time they finish the imaging and the FNA and gotten their results, it's one month down the line. So it is that, that's one of the delays that we aim to remove. So we go ahead and just do core biopsies for all our patients with solid lesions. Now, uh, what about excisional biopsy? So excisional biopsy is only done if the results are discordant. Like for instance, if the imaging says the, bio, the lesion is very suspicious for cancer, but when we did our core biopsy, it tells us it's benign. So there is basically a disconnect or a discordant uh, results between the two. 
that's when we might consider doing excisional biopsy. Now, ideally, what we do is we repeat the core biopsy with image guidance. If it is still discordant, that's when we move on to excisional biopsy. So what are the barriers to this entire process? First of all, we have awareness and access to care. So we have um, decreased awareness in our societies, and this is something that we can all work on through our, um, through our clinics, whether it is a breast clinic or not, any clinic where you encounter any lady, try your best to um, increase the awareness about breast cancer and what could be the symptoms, what to look out for, and for them to go for screening if they fall in the, uh, um, among the target uh, population. And also access to care, which is what uh, needs to be addressed by the Ministry of uh, Health. The other part is clinical evaluation, diagnosis and staging. So we have um, inaccurate clinical assessment and delays in clinical diagnosis, inaccessible diagnosis texting, uh, pathology and staging, these are all the things that have been discussed already in the previous presentation, and uh, they are within the Breast Cancer Screening and Early Diagnosis Action Plan for the Ministry of Health. Uh, finally, we have barriers to access to treatment because of financial issues, geographic and logistical barriers, social cultural barriers as well. There's a lot of stigma with breast cancer, and uh, we all need to work together to try and break all these uh, barriers. Now, this brings me to the end of my presentation. These are my references. Thank you all for your attention. Back to you, Dr. Man. Thank you, thank you. These are Dr. Manduku. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. And um, just in a summary, I think uh, you've done justice to this topic. Uh, for the listeners, uh, key is just to so that you are able to differentiate screening versus early detection and the high risk and the normal risk population, and the triple test that she has introduced us to. And also it's good to know the approach or the, the cascade of tests that then members are able or our patients are able to uh, have or access to. Now, our third presenter is uh, Dr. Linda Mose. Linda Mose will be putting up her slides. Uh, she is from the Kenyatta National Teaching and Referral Hospital. She's a radiologist at KNH, and we'll be allowing her to take us through diagnosis and linkage to care. Uh, Karibu, Dr. Linda. I hope you're able to put up your slides. I hope Linda can hear us. Are we there? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Linda Karibu. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be looking at breast cancer diagnosis and linkage to care. Um, a big portion of the presentation I have has also been uh, tackled earlier. Uh, because um, we know screening and diagnosis, especially in our setup, is very, very cl um, closely linked, given that um, we aim for early detection, but a lot of our patients who even come for the screening often are found to have pathology. So I may touch on a few slides and just expound on, a few, on issues um, that have been discussed before, especially in terms of imaging. Um, but the presentation is going to be brief. A lot has been said by the previous presenters. Um, so just in terms of background, um, as has been said before, breast cancer has become the most frequent cancer among women globally, with the latest incidence given by Global Can estimated to be at over 2.2 million new cases as per Global Can 2020 statistics. The importance of uh, this topic is that it is also associated with um, 
mortality, high numbers of mortality with greater than 500,000 deaths in women each year. The, in our local setup, um, low to middle income countries, uh, we often also uh, face late diagnosis because our patients tend to come late. Um, so in terms of diagnosis, early detection is critical. Um, so we need to go out and actually pass this message and possibly at every encounter with the female patients, do a lot of patient education so that we are able to catch this disease early. Um, screening has been uh, discussed. So basically we are testing women who have no symptoms. In diagnosis of breast cancer, we're looking at clients who come with symptoms of breast disease. This may be lumps, this may be changes in the architecture of the breast. Breast pain, uh, nipple discharge, uh, generally, a patient may just come and uh, tell you that they feel like there's something wrong with their breast. Maybe they have this heaviness. So we encourage the patients to actually have breast uh, awareness, self-breast awareness, which really is part of the screening. Even at the diagnostic point, um, I think it is important to have this message go out. Uh, that it is important to have the self-breast awareness where the patient is able to examine their breasts and as soon as there's any change that is felt, they are able to come to the facility. Um, we also have clinical breast examination and imaging as part of the screening, which has been alluded to, so I will not deliver it, and re prompt referral for diagnosis, followed by treatment and follow-up. Um, this has been discussed uh, for screening guidelines. Um, in our setup, we say 35 um, for mammography. Uh, most centers globally reduce the age of 40. Um, but we also have talked about, we've heard about the patients with additional risk factors who will require screening earlier. And they may require more intensive screening. So we use more than one screening modality in some cases. Um, so I will move to the um, uh, self-breast exam. I just have an illustration, uh, which I will uh, share. Um, this ideally is part of screening. And um, I th the important message again to pass to our patients is about the technique that is uh, employed in breast self-examination. Um, so a lot of time you see even when patients come and you tell them to show you the lump that they felt, like when we're doing the imaging, they will use fingers and poke the area of the breast. So it is important to have this information passed that you use the pads and not the tips of your fingers. And you use at least three of the middle fingers for the examination. And um, this has also, the technique thereafter is more or less that, like what was discussed in the clinical breast examination. Um, for diagnosis of uh, breast um, lesions, we also do the triple assessment where the patient will come with symptoms of breast disease, have a physical examination done. Um, this is uh, the clinical breast examination. Thereafter, they are referred for imaging, and uh, which is where now the diagnosis comes in. Um, under imaging, we have modalities that we use, which is mammography, um, which is the gold standard still um, for screening and also for diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, so under mammography, mammography basically involves um, X-ray use, it's a specialized type of X-ray imaging for evaluation of the breast. The conventional mammography that we know, which is um, two, uh, either conventional or digital mammography, is a standard two-dimensional uh, mammography where you have 2D images after the, the acquisition. Um, an improvement to this is the, the digital breast homosynthesis, which is a three-dimensional mammography. Uh, in each case, you have different sections of the breast which are imaged um, using the same same um, equipment. Uh, but basically, you have the digital machines which have the DBT um, feature installed. So they are able to give us more detail. You're able to see the breast in much more detail. And uh, tomosynthesis has actually overtaken um, the conventional mammography. 
because it has been shown to increase both specificity and sensitivity in breast cancer detection. Uh, in our country, we have quite a few centers who offer tomosynthesis at the moment, um, including our hospital, Kenyatta National Hospital, where we are able to do tomosynthesis. So for the people interpreting, it also makes it easier because it leads to less interpretation times. It is easier to see this um, images because you're looking at thinner slices of whatever uh, section of the breast has been imaged. Another modality um, that we also use is the breast ultrasound. Uh, however, this is not a screening modality. We use it as a complementary modality. And then we also have MRI, which can be used for screening in select populations of patients. Uh, so we said, as we said, uh, mammography is the gold standard. And the importance, again, is um, even for screening, we cannot overemphasize the fact that it has been shown to reduce breast cancer mortality. Um, it is crucial in detection of cancers, often showing changes even up to two years before a patient or physician can actually feel these changes in their breast. Um, things like small microcalcifications, which may start as a focus of ductal carcinoma in situ. So screening mammography is able to do this. Um, so we move to MRI. Um, so we say, we say it's used for a select population. We don't use it widely for screening because first it's not widely available and then it, um, it is also an expensive modality. And uh, even in terms of studies, um, mammography has still shown quite, um, has been shown to be the modality of choice to go to for both um, screening and diagnosis. So the indications for MRI, um, for example, patients who have mammographically occult tumors. Now, a mammogram also has its uh, limitations, especially when you have patients whose breasts are dense. Um, this tends to be patients who are younger, um, because at least the breast involutes with age and becomes more fatty as you age. Patients who are younger tend to have more fibroglandular tissue, they, therefore the breasts are more dense. And uh, basically you'll have a mammogram that appears almost white and you're not able to pick the masses because the masses that we pick on mammography also appear white. So in such patients, MRI is a useful modality. Um, the other limitation of uh, mammography, again, is the effect of summation of tissues because you have a breast that has been compressed and you're passing X-ray beams through and you have a lot of tissues that have overlapped in that section of image. So you have overlap, which creates summation and this can create false positives. So um, in such, in cases where you have indeterminate results again, and even ultrasound has not been able to, as a complementary move, modality has not been able to solve the problem, we can then use MRI. It's also useful in tumor size estimation, um, with detection of the invasive component of ductal carcinoma in situ lesions, where we suspect multifocal disease, which is not confirmed on conventional imaging, and the detection of additional tumor foci in the ipsilateral or contralateral breast. And when we have patients with axillary masses or axillary nodes with no primary tumor evident on clinical breast exam, on imaging, conventional imaging, that is mammography and breast ultrasound, we can use MRI to again act as a problem solver where sometimes what you are looking for are things like the uh, contrast enhancement. If you see areas of increased um, breast parenchymal enhancement or abnormal parenchymal enhancement, areas that demonstrate some of the features we look for in MRI, like restricted diffusion, then um, these are areas that can be biopsied in, in cases where you have disease in the axilla with no, with occult breast disease. Um, um, it can also be used uh, for planning for breast conserving surgery. And as we said earlier, patients who have high family, uh, uh, high um, risk, high risk patients, patients who 
Wayana with a um, high risk of malignancy or high risk uh, of developing breast cancer can benefit from MRI as a screening modality. Um, breast ultrasound is uh, also useful, um, useful in younger women, and as we said earlier, in patients whose breast density is increased, in which case mammography then becomes less sensitive as an imaging modality. Um, the uh, beauty with the ultrasound is it's widely available, does not have ionizing radiation. We can use it in lactating women, we can use it in pregnant ladies, we can also use it in male patients presenting with a mass and also to, as a complementary uh, study to correlate with mammographic findings, which were inconclusive. It's also possible to differentiate solid from cystic lesions on ultrasound, and it's also useful in guiding biopsy procedures. However, of note is we need to emphasize that it is not used primarily as a screening modality. Um, so we will move to when you have this image to this patient, uh, you say that your mammogram or your MRI or ultrasound, either as a, for younger, very young patients, probably it was a fast imaging modality or as, an, or as a complementary modality. There is information that is important to include in that report, which is the bio data of the patient, the age of this patient, because like in our setup, we've seen the cancers are, are being detected earlier. And most of the time, the patients are coming with late disease. The patients who are coming are younger, um, but with late disease. Uh, so it, it's also important to have um, the presenting complaints and physical findings. Risk factors, risk factor evaluation is important when reporting these mammograms because you want to know if the patient is at increased risk. And this will also guide you as towards whether to have additional imaging. Um, and then on the imaging findings, we usually use the Byrad's lexicon in reporting. And uh, it's important for the clinicians to also familiarize their, uh, themselves with uh, what we mean when we say Byrad zero. A BIRAD zero report basically says the evaluation is inconclusive. So we need further imaging so that we can arrive at a uh, diagnosis. For negative, which is BIRAD one, it means there was no mammographic evidence of malignancy or on MRI, there was no evidence of malignancy. So this is a patient who then can just be followed up. The nine findings are things that we clearly see, and you, you can tell these are not going to be problematic. Um, fibroadenomas, which are clear, uh, benign cysts, um, macrocalcifications. So these patients, again, will go for the usual follow-up. Um, then we have probably benign findings where this, that's by rats three patients will be followed up after a short while by repeat imaging so that you can either downgrade the findings to a BIRADS two or upgrade to a four, in which case you have to biopsy. For BIRADS4 lesions, anything above BIRADS4, we usually recommend biopsy because these are lesions then that have a probability of being malignant. And five um, is one that probably the probability is above 95%. BIRADS6 six, six is histologic problem. So these are important uh, terms to familiarize ourselves with as clinicians when we see the reports um, for diagnostic imaging. Um, the other part of diagnosis is the histology, which again has also been discussed. And uh, we emphasize that for solid masses, we should not do FNA. Uh, we see a lot of patients coming with FNA and they have palpable solid mass. The message should be co-biopsy for all solid masses and preferably under ultrasound guidance uh, so that you're sure you've actually gone into the mass the tissue for something. For cystic masses, we can do a fine needle aspirate and also for lymph node assessment for disease involvement. Um, under histology, we also are able to know the type of breast cancer. So this is information that we are given when we take the specimen and to also tell us whether this um, uh, particular cancer 
is hormone receptor positive or negative? And this are useful in um, this information is useful in determining the choice of treatment for this patient. Um, so when we have diagnosed the patient, the care does not end. Um, cancer care, uh, there is a, conti a, a continuum where you do not interrupt that flow. You should be able to link this patient to the next stage. When the patient comes to whatever level, if it's a primary facility and you do the clinical breast exam, you find a palpable abnormality. Where do you go to? You send to the next facility, which is able to do something that is more advanced, usually county referral facilities. Um, in our setup, like in KNH, being a tertiary facility, um, a lot of time patients are able to actually get all the services um, in the hospital. So, and the linkage to care, we want to provide this patient with the link to getting the correct diagnosis for the disease and definitive care. Um, some of the resources that are required are um, in terms of needs assessment, we have to look at the facility and see whether we have the infrastructure, we have the human resource, the consumables um, to, to be able to actually provide care for these patients when they come to us. Um, we need to look at capacity and availability of health workers um, at all levels who may provide breast health education, who are competent to do the examination and also referral of clients to the points of definitive care. So the approach um, usually is tailored to available local resources. Um, this has been alluded to earlier. So even right from screening, you look at the clinical breast exam and refer to the next tape if, you're, if um, you see that this is a case which needs further evaluation. We need to have clear uh, pathways for referrals um, that should also be um, passed out. Um, so at higher facilities where you have the cancer treatment centers, where you have um, surgical um, facilities, um, where patients can actually get the definitive treatment they require. We need to also have adequately trained human resource. We need to have equipment. Um, the other things we need to, is, uh, to do is have multidisciplinary team involvement because cancer care for any patient is not an isolated, uh, is not an isolated uh, thing because we have to have all the players involved from the clinicians, you have to have the people who image, you have to have the pathologists, uh, the radiologists, the surgeons, the physicians, um, depending on what kind of treatment. So multidisciplinary team approach is um, encouraged in the care of this patient. And offering support services, and especially knowing that some of our patients will come late, so they need to be counseled on um, the prognosis of the disease, the available treatment options, where to go for support groups, and pain management. So all these factors should be looked at. We need to look at this when we are linking these patients to the definitive care. The other thing we should not forget is after we've treated this patient, we need to follow up. In cases where maybe a patient has been caught early enough, surgery has been done, um, chemotherapy, follow-up surveillance in imaging is crucial. So we don't want to have patients who come back after five years with another tumor. So it is important to also pass the information that they need to come regularly for their follow-up screening mammograms. Um, so the, I'm coming to the end of the presentation. Um, so this chart um, basically tells us about um, the pathway when we are doing the breast cancer screening and early detection, right from the uh, point of, um, of contact with the patient. So you have at this level, you can first level where you have education on breast self-awareness and breast self-examination. 
This should be done by anybody who comes into contact with the patient, be it the nurses, be it the midwives, clinical officers, medical officers, physicians, breast surgeons. Um, and then we move to the clinical breast examination and we will, you can look at this chart, we can share this slide later. So in cases of any abnormalities, again, there's a pathway to follow, go to imaging, if there are this abnormality, go to histology. Any abnormality picked, refer to cancer center for treatment. Um, the second algorithm is for um, breast cancer. That lab, a person who comes with a lung a diagnostic workup um, is there. Are some slight differences, but again, it tells you what to do if the patient is below 35 years. You start with a breast ultrasound. Above 35, you start with a mammogram. This is actually found in the in the current uh, breast cancer uh, the action plan that has been recently adopted. So basically, again, it tells you what to do at each level of care. Um, when you find an abnormality, refer to the next level of care so that this continuum of patient care is not broken. Um, I think that is uh, all for my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. I'll, I'll refer us back to Dr. Manduko. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Sana. So thanks, Dr. Mose, for that uh, presentation and the overview that you've uh, given us. Uh, as the, we set into the next phase of these presentations, yes, you have been able to expound on the, um, the modalities for diagnosis and how we actually have to link that to care. And um, actually on the emphasis also of mammography, uh, being able to also know that there are other tools that we can use to complement uh, diagnosis, but not necessarily for basic screening. Uh, so. I'm still urging members, uh, if you have questions, you send them on the Q&A as we welcome our next uh, pair of presenters. Uh, we have a team that um, is going to tackle the subject of survivorship, uh, patient support and advocacy. Uh, the first one will be uh, Christine Mugositati, and she is executive director of the Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations. And I know she works uh, very closely with the National Cancer Control Program. Christine, uh, if you're ready, I can see your slides are on. You may go ahead and do your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Manduku, and of course, all the other presenters that have uh, gone ahead of me. So I'll be tackling the issue on survivorship, patient advocacy, and uh, patient support and advocacy. Um, Next slide, please. Maybe you can put it on view mode. Okay, so I, I would wish to introduce Kenko, where I'm currently um, working, um, because this is an organization that really deals a lot with um, matters, patient support, advocacy, and survivorship. So Kenko is a national umbrella body. Um, that has over 45 registered cancer civil society uh, organizations across the country. And all these organizations are active in various aspects of cancer control in the, in the country. And we've come together because of a united response against cancer. When I talk of cancer civil society, here I mean they can either be support groups, they can be community-based organizations, um, non-government organizations, others are trusts, foundations, as long as somebody is registered with the relevant government authority and they are doing um, anything on cancer, then we allow them into the network. And um, our vision is to be a premier national umbrella body that is providing leadership to cancer CSOs and patient support groups in order for us to work in unity and avoid a lot of um, silos when it comes to patient support. So our members um, are across the country, name it. It can be, you know, Northeastern, uh, the coast regions. Of course, most members are in Nairobi. We have Western Kenya all over the place, and we are still trying to bring in more members into the network. And these members, like I mentioned, have uh, different um, uh, aspects that they work on. There are those that do cancer education, 
There are those that uh, deal with uh, screening and patient navigation. There is targeted financial support that is offered um, by a few of them, especially for childhood cancers and a few adult cancers. Then we have psychosocial support that is offered by all the members, then palliative care and survivorship. This is very important because as the previous uh, speakers have spoken, there is need for increased cancer education in the country and of course screening for timely diagnosis. So these are the grassroots members who get to do a lot at, at um, the grassroots levels and educate the general public on what needs to be done, not just in breast cancer, but in the various cancers. Um, and we can see, of course, um, based on the global CAN uh, data, the latest 2020 and of course 2018, um, there's preference, of course, to concentrate on the top five cancers and uh, for adults and for the childhood cancers. But then uh, without discrimination, we all focus on all the cancers. Um, next slide, please. So for Kenko itself as an umbrella body, uh, we have a strategic plan that is coming to an end. And uh, part of the objectives that we had was one capacity building of these member organizations and for health workers. So these member groups have been started by um, people who've been through the cancer journey either as themselves or caregivers of, of, of other patients who, under, who have undergone a cancer journey. And so we need to build their capacity and we take them through a number of trainings, especially cancer science for lay advocates so that they can understand more about cancer, prevention, the education, where to seek treatment, what are the treatment modalities available, available in the country. When somebody talks of radiotherapy, what is it? So that they are able to guide patients at their level. Then we also do uh, capacity building for health workers. We have a number of, uh, of uh, sessions that we hold with uh, health workers on a monthly basis in collaboration with other partners, for example, KNH um, and others. Uh, we do networking collaborations and partnerships in cancer control. Uh, there's of course the main core um, activity for Kenko, which is advocacy that is aimed at influencing government policies and legislation around cancer for the benefit of the general public. So here we get to identify key issues that are affecting cancer patients. It could be matters uh, health financing, it could be issues on their rights, um, anything that is affecting cancer patients and we get to address with the relevant uh, government authorities. Then we do a lot of organizational development. Like I mentioned, these are groups out there in the grassroots and we need to build their capacity so that they are able to run them as uh, legit organizations. So they need to be registered by government. Um, they need to know how to work with volunteers and, and, and uh, uh, program staff. They need to raise uh, resources for themselves. So it matters proposal writing, financial management, uh, reporting even to different partners, whether government or other partners. We, we get to do all that. And even for Kenko itself at the umbrella level. Then of course, we always welcome um, partnerships in cancer control and forming various linkages for the benefit of the cancer patient. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Now on survivorship, um, the, the previous uh, speakers have spoken into prevention, into early detection and treatment. And so uh, as we are moving on with the country and the various uh, initiatives that have come up, we've noted that there's increased, um, the increased cancer education and early detection through screening and available improved treatments, more people are surviving cancer. So like today, um, if you look at the Kenko network, you'll find breast cancer survivors even as old as 10 years, um, some are even 20 years, 15. Uh, and, and this is very encouraging to note that we are having more and more survivors. And we hope we can get the same even across other cancers, childhood cancers and also the other cancers. Um, and so we need to focus on survivorship. How do we deal with these survivors? They've been through a cancer journey, which is not very easy. Um, cancer really changes a person and it does affect various aspects of a person, you know, financially, um, socially, spiritually, you know, all those issues. So we need to know how to, how to support these survivors. And of course, from the treatment and the journey, they get to experience long-term or other late effects of cancer due to treatment. 
and also because of society changes. And so for them, after final treatment has been given, it's totally a new way of life for them and they need support from all of us. Now, um, we need to address matters, health promotion, nutrition and physical activity. Um, as they are in remission, it doesn't mean that um, they should not eat well, they should not exercise. We need to encourage them to do this. Uh, there is also surveillance for recurrence and screening for secondary primary cancers, which we have seen uh, a few of them getting affected. You may find somebody may have been a breast cancer survivor, but then later on, it, 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 they get a different type of cancer. For example, I know last year, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we lost uh, one of the great advocates, cancer advocates, um, and each time she had been told she had been through at least five cancers. Of course, it's more of the metastasis that had happened to her. But now we need to support them when it comes to these recurrence aspects. Then there's assessment and management of physical and psychosocial uh, long-term and late effects of cancer that come, especially after treatment. So for breast cancer patients, they may get lithodema. Um, there are other, you know, for example, I think somebody mentioned about lung problems, bone issues, and all this need, they need to be assessed and to be managed and not just to assume that they've been through treatment and we are done with them. Then of course, care coordination and practice implications, supporting them through the healthcare system Yes, they may have completed treatment, but they have special needs that need to be addressed. Then of course, there's continued advocacy for them to be able to integrate back to society. Unfortunately, when someone is diagnosed with cancer, right now in the country, one challenge that we are dealing with is um, people being laid off work or missing a few opportunities that are work related. So they need to be supported back into economic empowerment yeah, it's a rights, rights issue, of course, that we are trying to see how best to support these patients. Um, when, when somebody is going through treatment, they get to miss work so many times. There are the side effects like nausea and all the weakness, and they are not able to report to work regularly. And you find them, you know, eventually an employer will let go that person. So when they are through with treatment, what happens next? They have families to feed. They have children to see through school. So we get to... Um, encourage these patients to, to join these members so that now you find, for example, there are those groups maybe who will do breast, who deal with breast cancer patients, they will now start knitting things like breast, breast prosthesis, the knitted types. And uh, we are able even to support them. We either buy and distribute for free uh, to other people who might need them or um, expose these, um, you know, expose this to other partners who would be willing even to market the produce for the, the, the products for them. So there are those that will need mats, others it's the scarves, um, others it's the table banking and they get something extra that they can use in business. So all this um, is a way of economic empowerment in a bit to, to, to integrate them back into society, which is very important. It's something that we all need to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe, uh, Nelson, maybe if you could go to view up there, you can put it on uh, whole screen. Yes, I think that, yes, that should be better. Thank you. Now, in terms of patient support, um, one thing, one common thing that we usually get, get um, at civil society level, uh, people will call in, for example, even as late as this afternoon, somebody called in and said they have a breast cancer patient who has, who has refused treatment because they are still in shock. How do I help this patient? So we get all those kinds of, of, of questions. So number one is to link them to care, find out which part of their country they are in and which is the nearest facility where they can get treatment, where they can get to, to see a medical uh, professional to support them. We also get to link them to psychosocial support and to our members across the country. So depending with where the patient is, we are able to link them to this kind of support. Since um, these members have been through it, we have those on active treatment, we have others on remission. And so they are able to share each other's story and encourage each other. And the younger ones in the journey get encouraged. These are the same members that we send to media so that they are able to talk about their stories and they are able to encourage and bring hope to the general public. 
Um, then of course, even uh, at Kenko level as the umbrella body, we get to give in kind support to, to patients, whether breast cancer patients or whatever type of cancer. When we do get uh, support, uh, from our various partners, we are able to provide, for example, face masks, sanitizers, and liquid soap that was really provided during the COVID season. Uh, we have a regular program where we provide breast prothesis, especially the knitted ones, uh, because they are cheaper to procure. And of course, uh, most patients tend to say they are lighter than the silicone ones, so they are very comfortable. Mastectomy bras go hand in hand with that of course but of course when we get donations for silicone ones we still receive and distribute to to the to the general public uh depending with vulnerability for other cancers of course we have things like stomach bags um knitted uh caps for the children in the wards once in a while we do fundraise for food and we distribute to vulnerable cancer patients so this is a form of patient support over and above the linkages that we get to offer and that is really beneficial for a cancer patient next please Oh, so those are just photos of, of, of um, some of the support groups receiving support, uh, food, some screening there. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, on patient support, uh, we run a very uh, key program, which is called the Cancer Education Materials for Patients and Caregivers. Now, uh, this, this program focuses on training health workers on how to break bad news. It's, um, it's a two-day training training where health workers are sensitized, you know, basics on cancer and how to give a cancer diagnosis to a patient. Then we get to do quarterly distributions of these patient booklets and the health worker flip chart that the health workers use to cancel the newly diagnosed cancer, cancer patients. So these booklets are just small, it's, it's, a like, it's, it's like a 50 page document, a small booklet with photos and basic information on what you need to know once you receive a new cancer diagnosis. Because you're there, you're in shock, you don't know what to expect. And, and, and the booklet takes you through um, what cancer is, what, what, what um, the signs and symptoms are. Once you start treatment, what is available in the country? What are some of the side effects of this treatment? Your diet, your physical activity, issues of palliative care. Um, that you need uh, as you continue with treatment and the support and the resource areas where, where you can get support uh, as you undergo your treatment. So this program started in 2017. We have so far trained about 58 health facilities and the criteria is to identify a facility that is offering chemotherapy, radiotherapy and or palliative care. Because now these are people who get to deal with newly diagnosed cancer patients and able to support them through their treatment journey for adherence and even for that psychosocial support. So this is a program that we continuously fundraise for. Um, of course, our biggest facilities are the ones with the highest workload, uh, the likes of KNH, KUTRRH, MTRH, but of course there are other facilities across the country where we get to distribute this for free and the patient gets to benefit. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a few issues on advocacy that I would wish to speak into. So I had mentioned that we get to identify key issues and address them with various uh, relevant persons like the Ministry of Health, the National Cancer Institute. We have CAMSA there, uh, especially on drugs and uh, the supply chain. Uh, national parliaments, the Senate and the Treasury, the National Treasury, mostly on funding for non-communicable diseases and specifically for cancer, and even how to tax uh, the sin commodities like tobacco, alcohol, uh, sugar sweetened beverages, and um, advocating for these kind of funds to go into healthcare programming. Uh, then of course we have the National Health Insurance Fund that we have really had discussions with continuously. And yes, the package, the oncology package might not be as comprehensive as, as we'd wish it to be, but we encourage all patients and even advocates and the general public to always have an up-to-date uh, NHIF card because um, as much as it will not cover in, in everything, it will still support a patient greatly. So these are continued discussions that we always have. I had mentioned about media and engagement for advocacy, just to create a message of hope to the general public because cancer and cancer diagnosis is not a death sentence and the public needs to be encouraged 
to go for um, early screening for timely diagnosis and treatment. Then um, we are represented in all the technical working groups for the National Cancer Control Program so that we are able to plan together and review cancer activities. And of course, when it comes to uh, development of guidelines, we are always together and even support with the dissemination part of that. Then different partners I had mentioned we work with, for example, Kesho, the, the Society for Hematologists and Oncologists, the NCD Alliance, the Oncology Nurses Chapter, various pharmaceuticals and other CSOs, um, just to form strong partnerships in cancer control. Then uh, we are the hub for the Africa Cancer Control and Research Echo. So these are monthly sessions that we hold for cancer education across Africa. Uh, just to disseminate a lot of information across the cancer continuum. And uh, right now we are working with 22 countries across Africa where countries get to exchange the cases and didactic expert uh, information on how to deal with some of these matters in cancer. Then of course I mentioned about cancer education for the public and health workers. Then uh, we have an SMS based platform uh, on Safaricom which gets to disseminate various uh, information on cancer, the various types of cancers and uh, short messages that the general public can, uh, can access. Um, next slide, I think that should be towards the end. Yeah, those, those are just photos of some of the advocacy work that we've done with media to highlight uh, key issues affecting the patient. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, back to the moderator. Great, great, Christina. Thank you for that presentation. And um, I think you've been quite clear. And uh, thanks for linking actually our patients uh, with the community and the support groups. I think uh, the message to members here is uh, possibly they need to identify how or where Kenco and the affiliate bodies are within their counties so that you're able to actually have that support linkage quick, quicker. Uh, we know many hospitals do not have patient support groups or even linkage to palliative care. So you, you, they do provide that support. Uh, we, we did have, uh, Christine is supposed to be talking with Sarah Wangui. I just want to confirm that Sarah Wangui, uh, is she onboarded because I was not able to trace her. Sarah, just if you are up or if you're with us, uh, just, um, Come on, I know we've been trying to reach you on the side. If not, I think Maria, Maria is uh, also coming up from uh, the National Hospital Insurance Fund. I think this is somebody we would like to listen to. Uh, she's a senior benefits and quality assurance and contracting officer at NHIF. Uh, she'll be able to uh, give us a perspective on financing and the role of um, insurance. I think all of us have had a touch of the NHIF and uh, would love to know what, what new things they are also bringing forth in terms of uh, cover. Uh, let me just do one more call for, uh, sorry, sorry, Adera, I know you are coming up, but I know that uh, I want to ask Sarah, but Sarah. I'm in, Sarah, I'm in. You are in, Maria? Thank you. Yes, I'm in, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. So you go ahead, put up your presentation, and uh, if okay. we get Sarah, she can come last after you. Thank you. Okay, you'll help me put, I've seen the presentation. Okay, uh, basically, I'm going to take you through the NHIF Oncology Package, which uh, was developed in 2016. And uh, what guided was basically on the utilization reports, because normally we look into priorities of health health disease patterns as per the notifications. So in 2016, next slide, next slide, uh, sorry. So um, I'll also take you through the presentation, uh, outline presentation. I'm going to take you through the statistics, the comprehensive benefit packages that we are offering within the oncology package. Of course, where to access the services, the facilities where you're expected to access those services and of course the strategic purchasing. Next slide. So like I said, statistically, NHIF started oncology package in 2016 and it was informed by the following. One, leading cancers in Kenya, 
whereby we realized a lot of uh, diagnosis or the notifications we are receiving across the country were on breast cancer. And we could, uh, based on our statistical analytics, we realized that 34% out of 100,000, 34 out of 100,000 population, those are, are those more of uh, women being diagnosed with breast cancer. Cervical cancer was at uh, 25 per 100,000 diagnosis we are, we are getting. And of course, there's the men on the prostate, can prostate cancer, which, uh, which was coming to 17 per 100,000 population. So basing on these st statistic, uh, statistics, it guided us on the need of having a holistic oncology benefit package. And uh, to date, uh, it has provided financial cover to uh, close to 23,534 patients based on the notifications we've received on basic cover amounting to 980 million 503. That is was uh, that 503,971. That was as at 2021 October. And then of course we have uh, 20, uh, 22,420 patients on complex treatment amounting to Kenya shillings 1,245,954,736.55. And of course, uh, those the foreign treatment, which I didn't get the estimate uh, due to short notice, but I'll share more later. Next slide. So generally, we have a comprehensive cover. And within this comprehensive package cover for oncology, there's the aspect of the, within the comprehensive cover for, for like the managed scheme, we normally have what you call the, uh, we have the preventive side of it, where the annual medical checkup applies. And you're saying within the comprehensive package, uh, the principal member spouse are eligible for free annual medical checkup at the selected healthcare facilities. And medical checkup entails the following, not less and not more than this. One, PSA, for men above 40, pap smear for all women, mammogram, body mass index where applicable, full hemogram, cholesterol, blood sugar, gamma GT, and of course urinalysis. So all this you'll be able to access on the annual medical checkup, which is context specific to, uh, uh, to members who have the, the managed scheme. However, for the national scheme, because of the financial constraints, we've still not been able to add this annual medical checkup unless now we now enhance it once the review of the uh, of the of the contributions which you've had our president even talk more about it so that we are able to give more on and focus more on preventive and promotive than just the curative part of it next slide next slide please so we are also, we focus also a, a lot on participation on an, annual cancer awareness, like uh, what, we, what we are doing right now with the KNH and Ministry of Health. And of course, within us as NHIF, we normally have uh, our, we normally say, uh, do those awarenesses also with, with, uh, within our NHIF uh, uh, marketing tools. And, uh, we do it through mainstream, sometimes through mainstream media, social media, of course, NHIF webpage, customer care desk at Duma centers and NHIF offices. And uh, we also continue to educate our members on the importance of annual checkups and health living. Next slide, please. So the second modality, I've talked of the preventive and the promotive, the second modality is a mode of treat, uh, treatment within the oncology package is the, the chemotherapy bit of it. And uh, what it entails within the chemotherapy will include the treatment planning process, the cytotox cytotoxic drug medication, of course, support medication and hormonal therapy. And then within the chemotherapy, again, you'll realize there's the basic first line, which you normally cater for up to six cycles. And uh, each cycle we pay 25,000, which is capped uh, overall. If you multiply the 6,000 by 25,000, comes to about 150,000. And then, of course, we have the complex, and uh, which is and uh, the third line, and the third line, which comes to about 150. You realize again, per cycle is a bit expensive, and it goes up to Kenya shillings 900,000. 
what we cater for in a year with that card off with the contributions members normally remove for 500 this is much we are able to cater for per every treatment for chemotherapy uh, for chemotherapy however again i wish to demystify but that sometimes the treatment plan is a determinant so you realize some patients may require maybe eight or maybe seven or maybe more than the six cycles like for basic chemotherapy or maybe more than five cycles for uh, complex chemotherapy so for such so for such scenarios or incidences they are normally reviewed on case to case so the hospital will send the notification we review based on the medical reports and there'll be a determinant however the baseline is on six cycles at 150000 for chemo basic and complex at 900000 for chemo complex next slide please Then the other benefit package you are able to access under the oncology is the surgical bit, because uh, sometimes surgery normally applies just to prevent the, the spread. So, and we've categorized our surgical package into three, the minor, the major, and of course the specialized. So minor basically are those special, uh, they are procedures which are not complex per se that may require even long stay. It can be done like a daycare case. A good example is like the biopsy that normally that is normally done for before you take the the, the patient uh, before the, uh, the there are some tests which are done with the lab, laboratory to rule out the type of cancer the patient is having. So within that, if the biopsy is removed, we'll pay under the minor surgical. And then of course there's the major whereby we are saying the maximum is up to uh, the the maximum is up to 80000 for in in level 4 and below and uh, and below and of course 240000 in level 5 and 6 the Kenyatta hospital and the all provincial hospitals we 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 used to we used to know as for our kef's level of structuring our facilities and then of course you have the specialized surgeries which are paying maximum up to half a million from level uh, in all level fives going upwards where applicable and where need be. Next slide, please. And then the fourth benefit is on the radiotherapy and uh, under the radiotherapy, it includes the radiotherapy planning, investigations, management of neutropenia, and of course the administration of the treatment. And you're saying, <laughs> Within the radiotherapy, we pay per cycle 3,600 shillings up to maximum of 20, 20 cycles, which will give us a total of 72,000. Again, you'll realize again, there's also special type of uh, radiotherapy, the brachytherapy, more so that is normally used for patients who have been diagnosed with uh, cervical cancer. Yes, cervical cancer. And uh, we are paying maximum up to two cycles amounting to 80,000 or as per determinant with the treatment plan. And then of course, again, within the radiotherapy, sometimes application of chemotherapy will also come in. So I will not repeat again because the basic, uh, the basic and the complex, I think I've already explained to it in details on the previous slide. Next slide, please. Then, of course, the fifth benefit package within the oncology is on the investigations and uh, more so on the radiological. You realize there's a need for, for appropriate diagnosis for cancer. And uh, we are paying up to CT scan, uh, two CT scan annually per family per card. There's also the MRI, which we pay with uh, two MRI scan annually per family. And of course, two ultrasound annually per family. So that is basically what you'll get. We would have given more, but because of the, the minimal resource we have, we try to integrate even with the other benefit packages that we normally give the uh, offerings to our members. Next slide, please. And then of course we have the rehabilitative, which we are in the process of now contracting hospice. It's in the face for terminally ill patients with a purpose and a view of uh, supporting them 
when, uh, when in the last phase of uh, care, because it's also part of a treatment plan for such dynamics within oncology care and management. Next slide, please. Then, of course, we have the overseas treatments and uh, the overseas treatment we normally do in collaboration with the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Board. And uh, we have availed it to all NHIF members irrespective of national scheme or managed scheme. And uh, the, the following parameters are the ones which are required. One, you must get, a, next slide, you must get clearance from the, uh, uh, you, uh, you must ensure that your car premiums are up to date. Uh, we are able to also to cater for both inpatient and outpatient. And then of course need to ascertain by a medical specialist. We need to have that referral from, from a medical specialist. Next slide. And of course, uh, referral letter from, from the facility or specialized consultant, and then approval from director of medical services. Once you, you have all those documentations in, in place for you to access the, uh, for the eligibility, we will then coordinate as NHIF with the approved agent to assist members identify appropriate facilities so that we are able to make travel arrangements and get a proforma invoice from the referred facility for us now to take up and pay up the whole bill. So yes, for foreign treatment, it is there, but it's subject to those preconditions, clearances from relevant authorities and all that, then now we take it up and support that member. Next slide, please. So again, where do we access those benefits? We are saying these benefits are open to all the facilities and we have three main broad facilities. This uh, contract A, According to us internally, we contract A are all government or public hospitals. Then we have a contract B, which are medium costs, private or faith based. And within the uh, number one and two of contract A and B, we are saying if you go to those facilities, it is walk in, walk out. You will not be charged anything because you have a comprehensive contractual agreement. We also have contract C facility, which are high cost and private facilities whereby we will pay a bit, then the member pays up because we can't also force people to go to members to go to uh, comprehensive, facility, uh, comprehensive facilities when they also have their own area or place they wish to go. So we also don't lock up such members, we encourage them. And then of course we have referral hospitals for specialized services like the level five, like uh, KNH, Kenyatta University, and Moi Teaching and Referral. So if you go to those facilities, it is walk in, walk out. Uh, if, if you go to those facilities, you're able to access those services effectively with an exception of contract C facilities, whereby we will pay our bit, but the members will do what? The member will be co-charged where applicable. Next slide, please. So, now we go now to the claims processing and we are saying, once you've already accessed those services within our facilities, it starts with the notification. So that notification automatically aligns it to the benefit that you've accessed. So it will come as a claim and we've decentralized within the claims processing whereby we have 158 networked branches and satellite offices which are able to offer those services and uh, that is where now the basic claims processing starts. And uh, of course we are linked with the head office. So we are able to get all the utilization to, uh, across the country through the claims, uh, through, the, through the branches that are linked to the head office. And the documentation required mostly are the invoice and of course the discharge summary, which is even aligned even to our current e-claim platform because we've migrated from the manual processing to the e-claim platform for purpose of fast tracking the claim processing. Next slide, please. So you'll realize again, 
Of course, there's the aspect of fraud, waste, and abuse. And uh, there has to be some form of control on how we are rolling out some of this benefit package for purpose of sustainability and ensuring quality of services are given to our members. So we are saying like for the oncology package, there are several, a good example are like the minor surgery or the daycare surgeries, optical and dental services, oncology being among them, which is the subject of today, oncology and radiotherapy and radiological services and specialized diagnostics or tests. We are saying all these benefits You'll require a letter of undertaking or an online pre-authorization request because we've automated the process. And then once the hospital notify, the member will be required to visit his outpatient facility for a referral letter for being issued with a letter of undertaking. So with that letter of undertaking, because you realize even the oncology package, normally they are offered in high, uh, uh, higher level of uh, facilities, maybe from level four to five. So once you get that referral, the higher level institution will make a notification. Then with that notification and all the supporting documentations, will automatically verify, do the audit, the clinicians we have internally within NHIF, then approval will be done for purpose of helping or supporting the beneficiary member. Next slide, please. So with uh, those, uh, that few remarks, I wish to say thank you. But at the same time, you can also always reach us through our NHI Facebook. We normally have those live presentations, which is National Hospital Insurance Fund Kenya, or Twitter at NHIF Kenya, website www.nhif.or.ke, and of course, LinkedIn, National Hospital Insurance Fund. And our toll-free line is 0800 0601. With those few remarks, I wish to say thank you. I love you all and God bless you. Over to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Dera Maria, uh, for gracing. I know these are rare presentations and members are, will be most grateful for yes. that overview of the covers. Um, yes. I just want to urge the panelists to stay put. Uh, we'll be taking Q and A's at the end. Uh, yes. Just uh, doing a call for Sarah. Uh, Sarah is one of uh, the cancer survivors. Uh, I know we lost at some point, I think, due to network, but just think to check that she can hear us, Sarah Wangoi. And Sarah, I think you were preparing an oral presentation. I think it, you didn't have slides. If you can hear me, you can just tell us. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, are you Sarah or Prisca? I think this is Sarah. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm Sarah. So, <laughs> Karibu, Karibu, Sarah. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. you, we can just give you the last 10 minutes just to tell us uh, something i know i know we are talking about uh, breast cancer and yeah. um, you will talk about survivorship patient support and advocacy what's your experience been like uh, we'll just give you a, a, some time thank you for joining come up sarah okay i'm um, sarah wangoi i'm a cancer survivor of the breast i was i did a mastectomy in 2015 now i'm battling cancer for seven years I had a reoccurrence like three times on the same breast. I'm still on active medicine, but now I'm going to do another biopsy because I have another reoccurrence. Uh, life with the cancer has not been easy because of the cost. The cost is too much. I had to lose my mother who was my caregiver because of stress. He developed ulcers. Uh, after she heard that um, I have cancer, I was diagnosed with cancer. She knew that she's going to bury me. Instead of me, him burying me, I buried my mother because of the stress caused by ulcers. Uh, so now I'm still doing, I was doing second line chemo, chemotherapy, which has not also been easy because of stigma, losing my hair. Uh, trying to cope with life, business is going down. The economy at, 
at the moment, the way the Kenya is going, uh, no money everywhere, uh, still stress. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Maybe I could just uh, pose a few questions that uh, how was your uh, case diagnosed? Because we've really been telling people that uh, we need to uh, promote uh, breast cancer screening through mammography. How was how were you diagnosed? Uh, yeah. Or when? Yeah. Okay, for me, I did an X-ray, which showed that I had a lump. After the lump, I, they advised me to go and do biopsy. After the biopsy is when I was diagnosed with cancer. But before that, they they had a a screening in my area where we were told to go and, and go for screening where they found out that I had a lump. For me, I thought that I'm going young, uh, that uh, I cannot get those kind of diseases because in my family, we don't have anybody diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, in my history, there's nothing like ca breast cancer in my family. So I knew it wasn't breast cancer for the lump. Yeah. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. So uh, yeah. thanks, Sarah. Um, probably I'll pose, I'll pose uh, more questions that, um, that yes, you were diagnosed. Was this in a rural? What kind of a uh, facility was this? And and where did you get finally uh, the care? Because most patients, uh, also we know that the Ministry of Health is trying to increase access and, and treatment centers. So are you able to get this treatment within your reach in terms of uh, home area, county area, or how? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your question. It was within my area because I live in Dandora because of the pollution, the pollution that is coming from the waste, waste from the dump site. It's affecting lots of people because of the climate. Huh? When we breathe in in the morning, it's, it's uh, the climate is not good. That's why we have in carbon dioxide. We breathe, we breathe in bad breath. That's what causes a lot of cancers in my, in my area. And after that, there's, a, there's no facility for cancer. There were people who came in to try to bring awareness, to create awareness in my country, in my village. Yeah, thank you. I hope I've answered you. Yes, yes, uh, you, you answered. At least we're able to locate you You're in the proximity of Nairobi. But uh, yeah. definitely you, you are a person who has, who has um, benefited from uh, maybe a screening program. Yes. And um, of course, uh, you're saying that you're getting recurrence. It depends on the stage where this was diagnosed, but uh, hopefully that you get better. So what yeah. I'll do, just stay, stay online. Um, yeah. The members listening may want to pose a question, but I would want us to now shift um, just use the next 10 minutes. Now we are approaching 4 p.m. We should be closing these sessions, but I know various people have sent questions to our panelists. Uh, we have uh, various um, questions that I've tried to see whether we can get a quick summary of. Uh, I will allow, maybe I will pose um, uh, two questions each to the panelists, just to try and see whether we can cover ground. So um, for our NHIF, I can see many questions were about the cover, um, and uh, some of some of these answer, some of these questions you already answered. One, some, someone was asking about uh, considering supporting home-based care for patients on treatment, and it would also be great if our patients routinely received palliative care under cover. I know you 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 answered that one, but um, there is a question that is. Um, that for the cover that is the screening program that NHIF is covering, um, is it possible to make yearly screening compulsory? I know you said that that screening is under the, under what is that cover? For civil service? 
So it the seems man- that it managed scheme. So it seems that screening, screening is not accessible to patients who are not under the managed scheme. So, and someone is asking, can you make it also annual? Then uh, one more question for you. Um, it is the associated cover with mental health. Uh, we know that um, someone is asking, why is there low reimbursement? I don't know that you'll be able to answer that for mental health practitioners. Um, or for psychiatric care. And um, maybe I could add one. This is concerns the high test, the, the high end tests, like what you're calling markers, histology and markers, whether you are able to, to cover those ones. Maybe they're called specialized tests in your case. So you'll be able to answer those ones, uh, Sarah? Yes. Mm-hmm. Marie. Yeah, Marie, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, the first question was on the home-based care support, if it's possible for any child to come in. Uh, this is a proposal which has been in place, but however, again, we have to look based on the contributions we are getting versus the benefits which have been rolled out based on the priorities. I think I explained that bit. We cannot give 100% per se, cent per se, but we also look at priorities. Where is the need? Everything is a need, yes, but where is it critical? However, that does not mean that we cannot do much uh, from what, what we've already put in place. Uh, probably the possibility of uh, probably reviewing the, uh, the, the home-based care and of course the screening program whereby once the, the statutory contributions have been increased, then we can review on case, on case to case by each benefit, including other benefits like the renal package, the mental health package. It, the determinant is the statutory deduction. How much are we getting? And within this statutory we are getting, what is it that is sustainable within a health insurance fund to be, to be able to support holistically without Bringing, uh, down, uh, bringing catastrophe within the health insurance itself. And of course, the healthcare providers who are offering the services. And of course, even the sustainability or quality of uh, care given to the beneficiaries. So behind the scene, a lot of factors are normally considered in. But once the review of the statutory uh, prorated rates have been increased, then these are some of the things we need to look into more so on the screening program, and of course, uh, even the markers, the histology, the, the, the specialized lab. The plan was there to introduce it, but again, after evaluation, because we normally do like a pilot project, that was in 2016, it was not sustainable. So we could not kind of proceed with it because uh, we would have gone down. But if the pool and the funds come in, then those are some of the things we need to look into because they are, they are equally essential. But we've just given the priority from the critical to the less critical. Thank you. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Marie, for the answer. I think that's uh, comprehensive. I know you are, you are trying to juggle care and access at the same time so that you're able to cover everybody. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Um, uh, Bedawi. I hope she's still with us. So Dr. Yes. Bedawi, um, there's, there's, a, there's a very important question here. It, it's concerning biopsy. Um, yes. And why, why someone is asking, why can't you just do an excision or biopsy of the lesion straight away instead of doing the core biopsy? And that's a very important question because I've, I've observed this from up country, people just do a, 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 a lumpectomy or excision or biopsy. Yes, yes, then, uh, thank then, you. Um, another one you'll have to tackle with this, I think it's, it's more of um, how, how you'll approach a lactating mom uh, and the importance of self-breast exam in this because of the breast changes during lactation, how then these Correct. women are supposed to approach the breast and then are there situations where FNA can be used for evaluation of solid tumors? I think those are good questions. Can you just answer? 
All right, uh, thank you. Actually, that was a question that I indicated I will answer uh, live. So thank you, uh, Josephine, for asking the questions. So um, are there situations whereby we'll use FNAs in solid masses? So like I said in my presentation, the issue um, normally what, um, what is done in the West in terms of using FNAs, they use an FNA as a, a triage uh, procedure, meaning for them to do a quick assessment so that they know whether this one is malignant or benign. So they do it, the patient comes in, they, the patient gets the mammogram or, and or the ultrasound, gets the FNA done in the same sitting, and then gets the results in the same sitting. The patient doesn't go home to wait for the results. And once the results are seen to be positive for malignancy, then they move on to do the core biopsy. Now, this is done in the setup whereby the healthcare system is uh, free. So because it is free, so it is uh, all the cost falls on the government. And so they have to try and reduce the cost of doing core biopsies by doing those FNAs that are in the one-stop clinics. So the FNA is done in that same sitting when the patient was doing the ultrasound. FNA is done, results interpreted, results given in that same sitting. And then they go for the core biopsy still because they cannot make a decision based on an FNA. They cannot go ahead and start treating the cancer based on the FNA. The decision to treat the cancer has to be done on a core biopsy specimen. That is worldwide, that is the guideline. So what about in our setup? What, um, why don't we do the FNAs? Because in our setup, we don't have that setup of a one-stop clinic whereby the imaging is done, FNA is done, results are given there and then. And also the cost here falls on the patient most of the time. So the, to pay for the FNA and still need to pay for the core needle biopsy, that is added cost onto the patient. And also because when, um, when a patient comes in, especially in our public facilities, they go do the imaging, then they go see the doctor maybe a week later. Then if they are sent for the FNA, they are done the FNA, maybe another week because it's booked. And then they get the results after another week. That's almost one month from initial presentation to getting FNA results alone. Now, after the FNA, they still have to go and do the core biopsy. So you see, it's it's wasting time and money for the patient. Now, secondly, why don't we do um, excision biopsy um, uh, at a go and because of uh, possible discordant uh, results? So the core biopsy procedure, it should be done by qualified uh, clinicians, clini uh, qualified surgeons who do core needle biopsy. And uh, when it is done by qualified people, the discordance rates are actually uh, very low. And um, actually it is done by either surgeons or radiologists when it is done image with the image guidance. So when it is done by either of these two, the discordance rates are very, very low. And why do we need to do the core biopsy instead of excision? Because when we do find out that it is a cancer, it allows us to give that patient a chance at breast conservation. Because if we remove the lump, most of the time what happens, the lump is removed, there's no marking for the, uh, for the MAFs, and then the histology comes back that it was a cancer and the margins are positive. So that woman has to be subjected to a mastectomy simply because she had an excision before. Now, had we known that it was a cancer before excising the lump, we could plan well to give her breast conservation surgery instead of a mastectomy. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks. I think that's a, that, that, that's a good answer. You've, you've been able to clarify that. Um, we have... Um, Maybe to Dr. Bor, I hope Dr. Bor, you are still there. It's more of a health system and access question. Uh, we're being asked 
and I think this is the debate that we normally also have, that demystify 1% access to mammography by eligible women. And someone is really um, looking at the, um, this access question. Not all counties have radiologists, not all the 47 mammograms are working. And I think you alluded to something like that. And mammography is not free. So there's a multiple issues here, but maybe you need to speak to this and uh, what the MO or the, the program is doing on that. And then we have one more question on um, uh, for screening of NCDs in rural areas. Uh, what strategy is being used? Are there any partnership arrangements uh, for that? Maybe I'll give you those two, then I proceed to the next uh, presenter. All right, thank you, Dr. Manduku, and uh, thank you for uh, the, the, the participant who has asked, you know, who, the participants who have asked those two valid questions. Uh, and uh, actually what you have said about mammography is, is valid. Uh, you know, uh, it's a complex of, 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 of reasons. It's not just simply that people don't want to access mammography, but it's a it's a complex or uh, it's a, it's compounded. It's not just one direct uh, reason. So, um, as I alluded to earlier, there are these barriers, and these barriers re prevent people from accessing even mammography, ultrasound screening, even the basic screening of us or the basic. Uh, um, method of early detection, which is a CBE. Uh, these structural barriers, they are social cultural barriers, they are personal barriers, they are financial barriers, specifically now talking about mammography. It's true we don't have radiologists, many counties don't have radiologists, and actually many of the county leaderships don't, they, they, you know, they, they, they don't understand why they should have a radiologist. Not to mention that radiologists are not that many anyway in the first place. Uh, and so what we are recommending, uh, you know, is an arrangement where counties share uh, the specialized uh, personnel. Uh, nowadays, there are even uh, radiologists who are speciali specializing in breast cancer, breast, breast imaging. They are, those are even fewer in the country. But um, if we have telemedicine or, you know, telepathology, teleradiology, those are some of the recommendations we have made and they have come out in our breast cancer action plan. Maybe if we have those arrangements where um, the, mam the mammographies are done in the counties by a trained radiographer and then sent for reporting to a specialized uh, person like a radiologist or a breast imaging specialized radiologist through a telemedicine arrangement. That is one of the way we can overcome uh, the structural barriers. To overcome the social barriers, we need to keep educating our our our, cli our clients. And actually, when we did the breast cancer uh, screening uh, awareness and, and mammography screening pilot, which was in uh, Nyeri County in 2019. One of the things that we learned from that is that um, community strategy is a very uh, powerful way of educating the community through the CHVs, community health volunteers. So we are putting in uh, resources there in terms of we have done uh, we have done manuals for training CHVs on cancer in general and Hello? more specifically on on cervical yeah. cancer. Mambo. We are still, still we are still we are still working on uh, mm -hmm. we, we are still looking to get resources so that we can uh, we can develop a specific manual for breast mm -hmm. cancer. But what we have already covers quite a bit. Uh, so if we send our okay, community health so. workers, they have we have seen that they are very useful resource. Oh, the Leo, sita, Even the use of unless I ask uh, someone to come see maybe, me go a meeting. Maybe I can request. Uh, hey, now I have to go to Nyali. You can mute. I don't Leo, know. Yeah, maybe mute. You can mute. Please mute, mute Maria. Maria. Yeah, sorry for that. But I was saying that uh, also what we learned in Nyeri, the pilot is use of social media, WhatsApp groups, 
Facebook, I know you are in a WhatsApp group, wherever you are, how many, I don't know, but those are very powerful tools. Uh, information flows very fast, you know, through the WhatsApp and through Facebook and so forth. So those are some ways we can overcome social cultural barriers. Uh, uh, for the personal uh, issues, yeah. we need those ones need to be addressed through behavior change communication, there are various strategies, and even that interpersonal uh, communication. And the CHV is still very powerful here. Uh, and, and also using uh, people like Sarah who have gone through a breast cancer, they have lived through the experience, they can share the experience as a way to encourage those who have not been screened to actually take up screening. On financial, we are still talking to NHIF so that they can consider screening. Um, but I know that there's a lot of pressure on them on many things. But one thing that we are also trying to do is to make sure that uh, cancer is, is anchored uh, in PHC, in primary health care and in UHC. UHC, universal health coverage, you know, it, was, uh, it is a big agenda of government and uh, continues to be. And one way, uh, you know, it has been said that this will be attained through primary health care. And this brings me even to the second question, which was asked to me, which was uh, about how do we improve or increase access to screening for non-communicable diseases, NCDs, uh, at the lower levels of care. Uh, I'm not sure I thought it very well, but uh, what came to my mind is uh, that through, um, through uh, primary health care, through breaking down our interventions to what can be done at the lowest level of care, because most clients, most patients are seen at the lowest levels of care, then through reaching that level, we can uh, reach more people for screening. And you know, screening is using simple tests. And so for, for uh, breast cancer, our action point, our action plan emphasizes on the use of uh, CBE, clinical breast exam. We know that it is not a screening, but it is for early diagnosis and downstaging of breast cancer so that we can diagnose at least 60% in stage one and stage two. So we are looking at that and the action plan even outlines what is needed for that to happen, which includes healthcare worker trainings, which the ministry is mandated with, and we are actively looking for resources so that we can train various cadres of health workers so that we can be able to improve, uh, uh, you know, the screening uh, coverage and even the coverage of, for the uh, clinical breast examinations. I let me let me leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Daktari. Um, I would leave. Maybe this is the last question. Uh, maybe to Dr. Uh, Mose. I think there's a critical question. I think it's more of explaining why we have this cutoff of 40 years um, and, and why we, we, we say we need to do mammography at 40 years. And then what happens to the younger? I think in your presentation, you, you, we talked the younger age group was also covered. But as you're answering the age question, you can also answer about the a fibroadenoma, whether that can become cancerous. And... Um, and talk, speak into male breast cancer. I think there was a question on that. Thank you for the questions. Uh, so let me start with the fibroadenoma. Um, it's a benign lesion with very minimal uh, risk of malignant transformation. The risk is about 0.03% uh, to 0.0% up to 0.1%, so very, very, very low risk of malignant transformation, which is why um, most, in most cases, we term them benign lesions and we just follow up the patient. However, when you have fibroadenomas, which appear large in size, like greater than 24.5 centimeters, we'll still recommend a biopsy um, so that uh, we are sure about the, the tissues types, tissue type that you're dealing with. Um, another reason that may warrant us to do biopsy for these lesions is when you have a patient who's very, very anxious, and uh, I, I think you just may want to, to allay their fears. 
In such cases, we also have the biopsy done. Uh, we have cases where we have fibroadenomas that may have the general appearance of a fibroadenoma, but you see subtle differences in imaging. Maybe one of the margins may appear slightly obscured or angulated. Um, in these lesions, they sometimes even call them atypical. We may want to just uh, assess. One thing is uh, from experience. Uh, we've seen that sometimes you have these lesions which may more or less appear to look like fibroadenomas, and sometimes the histology comes back and you actually find out you're dealing with invasive ductal carcinoma. You may have very subtle changes, such as um, indistinct margins, or they become obscured, or they become angulated. So um, you look at those very soft features. But generally, the risk of transformation for these lesions is very low. Um, on the issue of male breast cancer, um, the question was uh, why um, it is often diagnosed at more advanced stages. Um, well, there are very many, there are many ways to look at this uh, case scenario. One is that possibly, um, you know, breast cancer generally, issues breast are thought to be female issues, gender related. Huh? So it's thought to be a female disease. So there may be delay in health seeking on the part of the client. Um, the other issue is there's also the lack of public awareness of the breast cancer occurrence in men. A lot of people out there actually think this is a disease for females. So even when you see some small changes in the breast, most of the time somebody might just, you know, wait it out and say this thing will disappear. That lack of public awareness is a contributory factor, which is contributes to um, the, most of the time, the late diagnosis, which will explain why, again, this team must tend to be more aggressive. Um, the other issue could be the failure to recognize signs and symptoms of breast cancer. Again, you know, men don't routinely do clinical breast examinations and soft breast examinations. So, um, probably by the time that cancer is being seen or felt, it has actually grown. The other thing is the small breast and the central location of most of these tumors, again, tends to favor their, their progression because, again, the proximity to the chest wall is, um, is there's that proximity to the chest wall compared to the female breast where the tumor may be quite some distance. So there are several factors. And then there was the issue of uh, mammography in uh, patients who are younger. So breast density generally is one of the biggest limitations in mammography. And as in younger patients, in younger patients, we tend to have uh, dense breasts. Um, I, as I said earlier, when you tumors, generally breast tumors on mammograms will appear white. Fibroglandular tissue, which is what uh, uh, gives the breast that density, also appears white. So you may have a lot of false positives um, because of that decreased sensitivity and uh, leads to unnecessary patient anxiety, unnecessary biopsies. And the other thing is, again, uh, breast cancer is known to become more prevalent with increasing age. As much as we are seeing the disease in, um, in the younger people in our populations, historically, it has been known to occur with increasing age. Um, so for younger patients, we tend to go for a modality where you're likely to actually see the pathology. There are some instances where we actually do mammograms even as early as age 25, yes, but in most cases it will be done with another complementary imaging modality, and in many cases we will do MRI for this patient so that we are able to pick out these lesions. The sensitivity is usually quite low. Um, the other thing is again the with the false positives in the younger patients, because there's also the effect of the summation, summation of tissues, um, give, giving you pseudo lesions, lesions that are not actually there, but they are created because of the summation of tissues. Yet when you do another imaging, uh, form of imaging, you realize that it's essentially a normal breast. 
you have increased patient anxiety, you have more biopsies. So um, from literature, when you read um, studies that have been done elsewhere, um, the, actually the role of mammography in very uh, young females um, is very limited. So we tend to go for modalities that, that will be beneficial. Um, so 40, the age 40 is uh, what has been seen over time. Many authorities uh, globally recommend that screening starts at age 40 because by then again, the changes in the breast physiological changes are expected to have started in pollution. And uh, so the breasts tend to appear more fatty and you, you can pick these issues easily. And again, as I said, we see cancer, breast cancers uh, with increasing age. It's just that in our population, we are getting uh, different demographics. I think it is something that we probably need to also study and find out why we are getting more cancers in young and young. Yeah. So I hope I have answered questions. Yes, yes, you have a uh, doctorate. Thank you very much. And I think um, uh, without much ado, I'd love to thank this great uh, uh, team of panelists that we've just had. Uh, and also want to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Valerian Mwenda, who was here earlier. Uh, I would like at this juncture to just thank KNH uh, for hosting this um, uh, this symposium, and I know it's a series of symposium on NCDs, and we'll be able to send this, uh, my mic back to Dr. Ojuka, who is the main host. Uh, this is a surgeon from KNH. Dr. Ojuka, I know you may need to clarify some logistics and the way forward. And I want to thank our dear participants who have been patient, uh, being able to listen in. And uh, look out for more talks from the, NCD, um, the NCCP program uh, because as they continue to do awareness for breast cancer, cervical cancer, and any other cancers like prostate cancer. So welcome again uh, for these talks, uh, this kind of talks. Thank you very much, Dr. Ojuka. I believe you can take up the mic now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Veronica. I uh, appreciate your moderation together with Dr. Valerian Mwenda. I uh, also want to thank um, JP, Mariam, Linda, Christine, Sarah, and Maria uh, for a very good presentation. I think it's a wholesome presentation of uh, the situation in terms of breast cancer. And I think as um, Christine Mugo and uh, Maria indicated, the issues of uh, advocacy for cost and advocacy for other things are, are ongoing things and we are, can all be involved. So I also want to thank each and every one of us who uh, stayed, who came, who stayed and who participated in terms of asking questions. Uh, we meet tomorrow again from two to five again to just consider hematological uh, issues who are, which are still non-communicable diseases that are on the increase. Uh, I thank you and have a great evening. Thank you.